the federal future of the Murdoch Murders Crime and Corruption Saga, the aftermath of last week's partisan primary elections, and Governor Henry McMaster going to the gym and flexing his new statutory authority to request the investigation of a beleaguered Midland school district. We're going to be talking about all that and more in this special edition of the Fitz News Week in Review. Now, you might notice I'm Dylan Nolan. I'm not Will Folks. He is on the beach enjoying this week of hard-earned rest and relaxation with his family. But I, alongside my coworkers, have put together a great show for you this week. Particularly, I think you're going to enjoy the presentation by Fitz News researcher Jennifer Wood on the federal future of the Murdaugh murders case. She talks about the RICO statute, which some of you might be familiar with, and which I'll bet many of you aren't familiar with. Jen has been telling us for months that this is where the Murdaugh murders case is going, and she gives y'all an in-depth breakdown of what would be required to prosecute somebody under that statute so that you might start putting the pieces together as to how the federal government might get involved in this crime and corruption saga. Stay tuned. We're starting this episode off talking about partisan primaries. Now, you might be sick and tired of hearing about them because we've covered them for months, but there are a couple new updates from this week that you should know. Now, if you missed what happened last week, let me give you a quick update. In the 1st Congressional District, the most closely watched race from last Tuesday, Nancy Mace won. Nancy Mace was backed by former Governor Nikki Haley. She defeated Trump-endorsed candidate Katie Arrington. All right, let's start with partisan primary updates. Now, in case you missed last week, let me tell you that Nancy Mace won in the 1st Congressional District. This was the most closely watched race because it pitted former President Donald Trump against former Governor Nikki Haley. Former President Trump endorsed Katie Arrington, largely because Nancy Mace, the incumbent, criticized him for his role in the January 6th attacks on the Capitol. Now, Nancy Mace was not a never-Trumper. She was not a Liz Cheney type. She actually worked for the former president on his 2016 campaign, but I guess she felt the need to speak out. This was stepping on a political mine, at least in the short term. However, it did not deal her a fatal blow as she won fairly handily over Katie Arrington. Now, while Nancy Mays and Katie Arrington were seen shaking hands and were on the stage together following this race, that was not the case in all of the races in South Carolina, most notably in the Attorney General's race, where incumbent Alan Wilson was pitted against challenger Lauren Martell. Lauren Martell is a uh, Trump-style far-right GOP candidate. However, Alan Wilson was actually endorsed by Donald Trump. And I think that this is part of why Martell lost by a fairly large margin outside of her candidacy not really having the funds or legitimacy to earn uh, the majority of the vote. However, Laura Martel has decided to challenge the election. She challenged the election on the grounds that the poll workers weren't administered oaths that were required statutorily. Now, say what you will about Laura Martel, say what you will about Alan Wilson, but in my mind, you're not going to swing more than 10 points in an election because somebody was or wasn't administered a poll. This is a bad look for Martell, and this is me editorializing here, which I know that so many people in the comments don't like, but it's a bad look for Martell because she's literally just becoming the pieces that Democrats in national papers like to write about Republicans who will no longer take elections seriously in the wake of Donald Trump's failed contest of the 2020 election. Her allegations were simply frivolous. There was another candidate that we covered that challenged the election. Uh, Mark Corral, out of House District 43, was challenging incumbent Randy Ligon. He lost by 139 votes, about a little over 3% of the total votes cast. And he was objecting to the fact that four districts were moved prior to the election, one of which was not, pardon me, four precincts were moved prior to the election, one of which was not moved to a adjacent precinct, which is prohibited by the statute. Now, in order to have the election overturned or a new election ordered by the state party, he would have had to prove that the results of the election would have been different had this not happened. So that's a pretty high evidentiary standard that candidates seeking to have an election rerun or overturned have to 
reach. On Thursday, all of these complaints were heard by the state Republican Party. By the way, this was heard by the Republican Party and not by, say, the State Election Commission because these are partisan primaries conducted by the parties themselves. And the party decided against all of the challengers. However, the votes were slightly higher for Mark Corral's challenge in House District 43 than they were for the others. Now, these challenges are not nearly as important as the runoff races that are occurring. More specifically, the runoff race between Kathy Manis and between Ellen Weaver for the state superintendent of education job. Now, if you're not familiar with these two candidates, Ellen Weaver is a policy analyst out of Greenville, South Carolina. She's been an establishment Republican type for most of her career. She worked for U.S. Senator Jim DeMint uh, when he left his job as a U.S. senator to work for a think tank. She followed. Um, so she spent most of her career swimming in these establishment Republican circles. Her ties go deep. If you think of an establishment Republican consultant, establishment Republican political figure in this state, from U.S. Senator Tim Scott down to state house reps, they probably know Ellen Weaver. She's probably spoken to him. Contrast that with Kathy Mattis. Kathy Mattis is a career educator slash educrat. She serves on the Lexington County Town Lexington County Council. And um, she runs the equivalent of the teachers union here in the state of South Carolina. Now, there have been allegations made by numerous people that Kathy Manis is effectively Molly Spearman 2.0. Now, you might be saying, what does that mean, Molly Spearman 2.0? Molly Spearman is our current state superintendent of education. She's a Democrat. I don't think anybody even denies it at this point. Molly Spearman is a Democrat who switched to being a Republican so that she could win the state superintendent of education race. If you're unfamiliar with South Carolina politics, a Democrat hasn't won a statewide elected position since like uh, the, the prehistoric times. I don't know. But it doesn't happen. So if you're a Democrat and you want to win, you run as a Republican. This is just baked into the cake here in South Carolina. And many people are saying that Kathy Mattis is doing the same thing. Now, I can't see inside of Kathy Mattis's head, and maybe that's a good thing. So I can't tell you what she is in her heart of hearts but I can tell you that's what a lot of people are saying. What I do know is that this position doesn't have a ton of power. Now, if a school district's failing, the state can step in and try to remediate that problem. But most of the important policy decisions are made at the school board level, which is why what I'm about to tell you is very important. The governor has just been given a lot more authority to police school districts more specifically school board trustees. Just this legislative session, he was given the power to impanel an investigation headed up by the state investigator general and to use the findings of that investigation to remove school board trustees, school district trustees, who are found to be doing their jobs poorly. And there's like seven different categorizations of how they could be doing their jobs poorly. They could simply not show up. They could abuse the trust of the public. And he's specifically requested an investigation into Richland School District 2. Now, why has he requested an investigation into this district? If you're asking that question, you haven't been reading my coverage of that district. My God, that district is really, they, they seem to make the news like once a month for something absolutely ridiculous. Let me list a couple of stories that I've written about that district just this year. And keep in mind, we're like halfway through this year. One, the superintendent was accused of starting a physical altercation with a parent at a school board meeting. Now, there's two sides to every story, but two, let's talk about when a school board member herself told the chair of the school board that she would catch her mother's ass outside after the school board meeting. She was subsequently arrested. So while there might be two sides to that story, an arrest speaks volumes. There, of course, were allegations made in a lawsuit that the school, one of the schools in the district, failed to protect a student from being sexually harassed when he was playing on the school basketball team. It goes on and on. 
there have also been allegations of financial improprieties, financial mismanagement. So this is certainly a good pilot district to test these new capabilities out on. Now, if you live in Greenville, if you live in Charleston, you might be like, why do I care about this school district run by a bunch of clowns in Columbia? Why do I care what happens to them? Well, you should care because, unfortunately, these idiots aren't unique in this state. I mean, I didn't join Fitz News thinking I was going to cover education. I was just given a story because there was too much going on that day and Will didn't have time to cover it. And I wrote one story about a school district. And then I start getting tips and tips and tips. Y'all, there's a lot of messed up stuff going on around the state in school boards. It seems like a lot of these people run for that school board seat so that they can have control over like a little petty fiefdom. And they don't really use that control to benefit the students. So if these people know, okay, the investigator general might crack open our books, the governor might throw me out of my seat, that could be the first step in remediating a lot of these leadership failures that we see across the state. So if you live in Greenville, if you live in Charleston, you should pay attention to this, or at least know that these school administrators are going to be paying attention to this. The school administrators at the school that your kid goes to that might not be doing the best job of providing an education for them. Or maybe the school administrators at the school that your kid doesn't go to because you send them to a private school because the school is so terrible. Now, this is important, of course, for parents of kids who are currently living in the state. But this is also the first step to the kind of accountability that we need to fix South Carolina's education as a whole. Now, why do we need to do that? Because we're competing with Georgia. We're competing with North Carolina. We're competing with Florida. People are leaving northern states with high cost of living, which, I mean, God, look around right now. Would you not do that, too? It's, it's hard enough to live here. But when they choose which southern state to move to, they're not going to want to choose South Carolina for the schools. That's for sure. So if we want to get people who are talented, who want their kids to have a future, and who might own businesses to take their money here, to buy houses here, to improve our tax base, to bump those numbers up so that South Carolina can have a future, we need to have a good education system. Which is why I'm so excited about this investigation. Look, you can throw one or two of these clowns out in Richland County and not that much is going to change. But if it lights a fire under the asses of a lot of these incompetent administrators across the state, makes them think twice about running maybe, then we might start seeing the change that we need. Now, this alone won't be enough, but it is something that I've advocated for last legislative session. So I'm really excited to see it get passed. And I think that this could be an important tool in the toolbox of state officials who are looking to improve education outcomes in South Carolina. All right, all right, all right, all right. I see you guys, you murder, murders, crime and corruption saga fiends. We're going to give you your next hit. You're shaking, you're jonesing, you're coming to your dealer. Here we are. But I'll tell you what, we got some good stuff in this week. We really do. Now, in case you missed it, the murder, murders podcast hosted by our very own Mandy Matney and Liz Farrell did a great job talking about Buster Murdaugh and Alex Murdaugh working together to get Buster back into law school this week. Now, Buster was kicked out for cheating. Buster had terrible grades. And if this happened to you or me, we would probably not have a second chance. If this happened to you or me, we probably would not have $30,000 to pay one of the most prominent attorneys in the state to petition repeatedly the dean of the school, the dean of the law school to get us back in. If you want to hear how Alex and Buster put together this scheme and frankly how entitled they sound when the scheme doesn't work, then you got to listen to this podcast, you got to listen to the calls. I've put together a collection of calls. It's a little under half an hour, and it shows you from when they first 
speak about getting Buster back into law school to when the school tells him that he will have to wait into the spring semester of 2023. It gives you this whole timeline so you can really understand the full progression. You can listen to that, or I would also encourage you to listen to Mandy Matney's Murder Murders podcast, where Liz and Mandy break it down, and there's a little bit of editorializing in there to help you have some of the context that you might need for these calls. I'm not going to play any more of it. I'm not going to play any clips. One, because in editing that last week, I had to listen to these clips about a thousand times. I mean, I was hearing 10-4, Bo. I was hearing Alex in my sleep. Y'all, video editing is something else. Anyway, I'm not going to play these clips because we've already put them out there. I don't think that we need to retread that ground because we have something awesome that's new for you this week. Fitz News researcher Jennifer Wood put together a special presentation for us about RICO. Now, RICO is a federal statute that allows prosecutors to come after organized crime rings. So in this presentation, which will be the remainder of this episode, Jennifer is going to go through how this statute came into being, some instances where it's been used, and those of y'all who've been following this case are going to quickly see the connections to the Murdoch murders saga and start thinking about how that could be applied here. Without further ado, here's a special presentation from our researcher, Jennifer Wood. As the investigations and indictments in the Murdoch crime and corruption saga continue, we keep hearing people mention RICO and they're asking why hasn't RICO been applied to some of these crimes? So we wanted to give everyone a quick breakdown on what we know about RICO and how it might be applied to some of the crime and corruption that we've been seeing today. So first I'm going to start with a quick history lesson on RICO. RICO is an acronym for the Racketeering Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, and it was passed in 1970 in an effort to make it easier to prosecute and take down criminal organizations like the Mafia. Prior to the passage of the RICO Act, crimes committed by members of criminal organizations were prosecuted individually. This was problematic for a number of reasons, but mainly because the head of, heads of criminal organizations don't like to get their hands dirty, and they often delegated the actual criminal acts to those in the lower level of the organization. So those lower level members would be prosecuted and put in prison, and the heads of the organization would just recruit more members to commit crimes, and the crime would continue. In recent years, there have been more instances of RICO being utilized in prosecuting white collar crimes, and we're gonna get into that a little more as well. I'm going to um, read the US Department of Justice's definition of RICO. It is long, but this is gonna be the starting point for how we break it out, so bear with me. So according to the US Department of Justice, it is unlawful for anyone employed by or associated with any enterprise engaged in or the activities of which affect interstate or foreign commerce to conduct or participate directly or indirectly in the conduct of such enterprises affairs through a pattern of racketeering activity or collection of unlawful debt. The first thing we want to look at are the two key words in RICO, which are criminal enterprise. In order to prosecute a case under the RICO stature, federal prosecutors must prove that a criminal enterprise exists. So what exactly is a criminal enterprise and how do they prove that? Enterprise includes two different categories of association. The first is an enterprise as a legal entity. So we're looking at partnerships, corporation, businesses, or associations. The second is an individual or simply a relatively loose-knit group of people or legal entities that are associated in fact. These latter groups are actually referred to as association in fact enterprises under the statute. So when you see gangs and mafia organizations prosecuted under RICO, often they're being prosecuted using the association in fact. So now that we know what an enterprise is, what makes an enterprise criminal? To make an enterprise a criminal enterprise, four things must exist. First, the enterprise must have affected interstate commerce. So interstate commerce is simply the transacting or transportation of products, services, or money across state borders. Second, the defendant was associated with or employed by the enterprise. Third, the defendant engaged in a pattern of racketeering activity. So pattern basically means one crime isn't going to be enough. Um, you have to show a pattern of at least two crimes. 
The pattern requires that the crimes be related in some way. So we're looking at the same victims, same methods, same participants, or that it's continuous, meaning it was conducted over at least a year. And fourth, the defendant participated in at least two acts of racketeering over a 10-year period. When RICO was first passed, it was intended to break up organizations that were widely understood to be criminal, but as time went on, it became a weapon for federal prosecutors to battle white-collar crime. So it, it would make sense to try and understand the use of businesses as criminal enterprises. If a business operation, even if it's a legitimate business operation, is used to run an illegal scheme, it can be considered a criminal enterprise. So a legitimate business operation may be a front for criminal activity, such as money laundering. The United States Code lists 35 specific crimes, which are considered rackets. Now, these include, but they're definitely not limited to, racketeering, including gambling, murder, kidnapping, arson, drug dealing, bribery, extortion, embezzlement, and obstruction of justice. A racket is basically a dishonest service, which is predicated by need, which has been created by those offering the solution. So an example would be protection money. So let's say a gang is causing all sorts of trouble in a neighborhood and the business owners and residents are in fear. So the gang then approaches the business owners and residents and informs them that, oh, we'll protect you for a price. Now, the business and owners and residents, if they refuse that offer of protection, they have issues. Um, and this is one of the most known organized crime rackets, but there are many, many more. These crimes make up the foundation for the RICO charges. Without the element of racketeering activity, a RICO claim would be difficult to prove. But because one must also prove racketeering activity in addition to pattern, enterprise, operation, management, etc., a RICO claim is going to be one of the most difficult violations to establish. So it's been said that the need to prove racketeering activity essentially requires a plaintiff or prosecutor to prove a crime within a crime. And a plaintiff or prosecutor has no chance of proving the greater crime, for example, the RICO violation, unless they can first establish a lesser crime, for example, an act of racketeering. So the lesser crime is sometimes called a predicate act. Predicate offenses sound confusing, but it's actually a really simple concept. There are criminal offenses that are simply a component of a more serious crime. Mail and wire fraud are the most common RICO predicate acts. To prove a RICO claim based on mail or wire fraud, it must be proven that each defendant in the case intentionally engaged in a scheme to defraud, and then they use interstate mails or wires to further that scheme. So mail and wire fraud are actually one of the two most common crimes charged by federal prosecutors. Both mail and wire fraud require a scheme to defraud the victim of money or property. In other words, the defendant must have deployed a means of de deception or deceit, for example, false statements, misrepresentations, or concealment, to deprive the victim of money or property. So the main difference between mail and wire fraud is the jurisdictional hook that allows the Department of Justice to prosecute this conduct as a federal crime. So mail fraud is always going to be a federal crime. Under the mail fraud statute, the defendant must use the U.S. Postal Service or any private or commercial interstate carrier like FedEx or UPS to further the commission of the fraud. But in contrast, the wire fraud statute requires the use of interstate wire transmission, such as email, fax, phone call, text message, or the use of an internet chat room to further the commission of a crime. The key word in the wire fraud is interstate, so it would have to be a wire transmission that crossed state lines for it to be prosecuted federally. Okay, so now we've gone over the key elements of RICO in criminal enterprises. Let's, let's look at the big question. Why haven't Alec Murdoch and his co-conspirators been charged with RICO? So to do that, I think it's important to look at the indictments and charges that have been levied against Alec Murdoch and his co-conspirators to date. So right now we're looking at breach of trust with fraudulent intent, computer crime, money laundering, and criminal conspiracy. Of these charges, the criminal conspiracy would be the one most likely to be considered a crime of racketeering. But to establish a criminal conspiracy under RICO, the prosecutors must prove that the defendant knowingly agreed that a conspirator would commit a violation of one of the substantive sections of RICO, which we discussed above. 
So the RICO conspiracy provision does not require the commission of an overt act. Moreover, it is settled that the conspiracy offenses may constitute predicate racketeering acts alleging conspiracy. So for example, a predicate act alleging a conspiracy to commit murder. Now this is because a RICO conspiracy is not a conspiracy to commit the alleged predicate acts, Rather, a RICO conspiracy offense is a conspiracy to participate in the affairs of an enterprise through a pattern of racketeering activity. So really what prosecutors need to do is they need to prove that there was racketeering involved in Murdoch's financial crimes. Did Alec and his co-conspirator offer a dishonest service that was predicated by a need that they created and then offered a solution for? At this point in the investigation, I honestly don't know the answer to that, but given the complexity of his financial crimes, I'm confident that federal investigators are closely reviewing the evidence. All right, y'all, what do you think? Obviously, the bar for prosecuting somebody under RICO is pretty high, as well it should be, but there does seem to be a lot of parallels between past usages of RICO by prosecutors and the situations we are seeing play out as we learn more about the Murdoch financial crimes, as well as the crimes of his co-conspirators, both other attorneys and bankers, without whom he would not have been able to perpetrate any of his crimes. Now, we don't know what federal investigators have been doing throughout this whole process. Obviously, the state, Alan Wilson, and the prosecutors at his office have been dropping the hammer pretty hard on Murdaugh and his co-conspirators. And you can be darn sure that the feds aren't watching this. I mean, with an FDIC-insured bank involved, you know that federal banking regulators, at the very least, are going to be watching closely and probably will be stepping in soon to take action against the bank. We don't know what other federal agencies may or may not be investigating Murdaugh. But if I were a betting man, I would certainly bet that the feds are going to be involved with this case going forward. And we here at Fitz News are going to do our best to give you kind of an over the horizon look at what they might be doing with more special reports and more analysis like what Jennifer would produce for us here. So, of course, thank you, Jen, for putting the time in to research this and to put that information together in a way that's digestible. And, of course, thank you all for watching The Week in Review this week. Thanks for putting up with me hosting it. I'll be hosting it again next week, and then Will will be back from vacation. If you have any comments about how we could improve this show, other than, you know, getting Will back in the chair, I'd love to see him down in the comments. Uh, I edit all these videos. I produce them all. And I, I really do read what you guys write down there. We make this show to deliver you guys the news that you care about, that's relevant to you in the state of South Carolina every week in an entertaining and digestible format. So anything you could tell us that would help us do that, we're all ears. So please leave it in the comments down below, or if you're listening to this on a podcast, you can email me, dylan at fitznews.com, or reach me on Twitter, dnolan2000 on Twitter.